Hey guys, welcome to another Living SATV video. David Kuleku and Eric here, guys. So, Eric, what are we going to do today, man? Uh, we're going to do the public art tour. I call it Joburg Top 20. There's a lot to see. Um, so many artworks all over the inner city. Yeah. Okay, guys, so make sure you share, subscribe, and stay tuned. Oh, it was great meeting you guys. I hope you're doing an awesome video as always. And to all the viewers out there, please like and subscribe. Oh. Great work, great work. Uh, good morning, Living in SA TV people. Today it's a special day. We are here with Eric. But Eric will introduce himself, tell us actually who he is, what his role you know, in the city, and the significance of the space that we are at today. And also the tour that we're going to be doing you know, with him, that is going to be taking around, you know, jo jo around Johannesburg. He will be able to contextualize what is it that actually we're going to be seeing today. Without any further ado, Eric, we are here. Who are you? Who are you, Eric? Tell them. Who are you? Okay. Morning, um, Kululeko. So thank you. I'm Eric Itzkin. I'm the head of heritage for the city of Joburg and I've been involved for some time in developing public art. A lot of it you'll see is on heritage themes um, and, and what we'll be presenting today is a package which we call the Joburg Top 20. It's a public art tour that brings together some of the most amazing artworks, um, particularly in the inner city where we've got a big concentration of art. Uh, there's more than one can show you in, in even one tour, um, but I can promise you that these are very special artworks, um, part of a rich, uh, very diverse collection, and there's something for everybody. Um, so we're starting, we're starting in, in actually a very historic uh, site, uh, quite deliberately. This is the birthplace of Johannesburg where it all started in 1886 uh, you had the world's biggest gold rush and people flooding in from around southern Africa and different parts of the world uh, seeking their fortunes and uh, the town the original town was laid out from here it was called Reinkis Laughter um, and there's a beacon this is in fact uh, Joburg's oldest monument. Okay. It has a blue plaque as well. This is the Reinkislachter beacon. Alongside the beacon uh, we've got um, an artwork which I'd love to show you. Um, fantastic uh, mosaic map of uh, this Reinkislachter triangle. And at the moment we are standing right at the tip of the triangle, the apex and it extends down past Hillbrow going towards town. The base of the triangle uh, at the bottom there is Commissioner Street. Um, so actually in the course of the tour we'll be following pretty much the line of this, uh, uh, this original triangle. Um, so you can see the shape of the early town and the actual streets uh, th that were named uh, in the early days. Um, it was a pretty small area, two and a half square kilometers, and then it just burst out from there. So, um, like a river bursting its banks, it couldn't be contained. But this was the original, um, this was the original municipal area up till 1901, and this uh, huge metropolis grew from there. Uh, it was called Eitfalgrond. It was just land left behind when they proclaimed the uh, farms around and it was thought to be unsuitable for mining or farming so it became the town. Uh, the artwork itself um, was done around uh, 2012 by a, an art collective called the Spaza Art Gallery who are based in Troyville. They were led by uh, Drew Lindsay, who's a, who was a master mosaic artist, um, and uh, it's it's a it's a brilliant picture, like a little capsule from which Jova grew. Wow, that's amazing, Eric. What you've just shared. So, to to put it succinctly, so this is where this is a bad place, a, a bad place of Johannesburg. 
That's, it. That's where it started. Absolutely. When you read the archives, is there some information on why here? What is it that made this specific location to be ideal, you know, to commission the city of Johannesburg as we, as we know it now? Yeah, okay. So, well, the mining was happening in the south, uh, in the area around Turfentine. So that was the farm uh, at the bottom there. Uh, you had the other two towns, uh, sorry, the other two farms on either side. You had uh, Bramfontine in the west, uh, and Dwinfantine in the east. So this was, like I said, Eidfaggrund, something left over, almost like wasteland, but it became uh, the biggest, uh, the biggest city uh, in Africa. Oh wow! I, I heard when you talk about farms, Ferrara Top. You didn't mention Ferrara Top. Was it? Yeah. Was it? Was it one of the first farms? Um, yes, you you had. Um, well, Ferrara's town was actually a mining camp just on the western edge um, so there were different camps but the, tr the true town began here 1886 just where we're standing okay beautiful beautiful uh, beautiful all right we're here uh, at, the, at the entrance to Hillbrow uh, across the road is Constitution Hill uh, the famous monument now a world heritage site and we're greeted here by uh, this very welcoming statue uh, which is called the Angel of the North so the arms are wide it's greeting newcomers to Hillbrow Hillbrow is a place of arrival for many people from different parts and uh, it's it's actually celebrating the fact that this is an Afropolitan gathering place um, down the bottom of of, of the uh, artwork uh, on this column uh, you've got the words the famous words from the French Revolution liberty equality fraternity so I'm not sure if they're in French here yeah? probably but they're in many languages um, languages from all over the continent from it's our country yeah exactly so uh, it's celebrating humanity um, this artwork was created by uh, an artist from KwaZulu Natal uh, he's Winston Lutuli so Winston is best known as a wood carver but actually the, this angel is made out of concrete so we're here outside the, um, the Joburg theater uh, which used to be known as the Civic Theater a massive arts complex and this artwork uh, is called the playmakers some people also call it the dancing ladies so three women uh, kind of abstracted forms um, dancing merrily in front of the theater it was uh, created um, together with the actual development of the civic theater and the artist was Ernest Ullmann uh, who was an important artist in Johannesburg uh, Ullmann came uh, came to uh, South Africa around the 1930s from, uh, from Germany um, and uh, it's kind of a modernist artwork you would say uh, perhaps one of the first uh, notable modernist artworks in the Johannesburg inner city okay so we're looking across uh, Braamfontein and um, at the top of Rissick Street you've got the miners monument which is a kind of iconic uh, tribute to the mining industry so it features two uh, actually a group of three miners uh, an underground team from around the 1930s uh, there, there's a, a, a white miner two black miners as well uh, it's kind of celebrating the fact that um, all these different people helped to build the city uh, to create the wealth to build the mining industry on which uh, Joburg is founded um, 
and of course the black miners themselves were the backbone uh, of the industry um, so that artwork uh, is more in a realistic kind of mode it's from around the same sort of period as the playmakers but that is a more modernist uh, artwork the the uh, the miners sculpture was created by um, David McGregor and it was gifted by the Chamber of Mines uh, the Transvaal and the Free State Chamber of Mines gave it as a gift uh, to the city of Joburg. So we're here at the corner of uh, Jorison and Mele Street in central Bramfontein looking up at a soaring 10 foot high crockery mosaic. Quite a unique artwork. Uh, it's called the Nzunza Portrait for Bramfontein and it's made up of hundreds of um, ceramic plates uh, many of them were made locally uh, at, the, at the famous Lieberman pottery. Um, the artwork was created by artist Hanali Kutsia and erected by a team of mostly women uh, assistants. Um, and it harks back to the Nzunza culture. So the Nzunza people were an Indabele people who lived on the high felt in the 1600s so going back about 400 years and uh, one thing that was remarkable about them is that they would engage in cultural exchange with other groups like the Swazi and the Zulu so it developed into a kind of a hybrid culture and that's part of what you see there you know, with a lot of the hairstyles, which uh, are part of the culture of Josie as well, you've got um, people mixing and matching different styles. Um, and that's very much what, uh, what Joburg is about. You know, Joburg is a melting pot, uh, the most diverse uh, city in, uh, in the country and maybe in Africa. Um, and this is a tribute uh, to that saying you know you can create beautiful things by interweaving styles and cultures um, so I think uh, just a fabulous artwork right so um, we are still in Bramfontein now at the Liberty Indwe Park Indwe means blue crane it's a park developed by the Liberty group here on their campus across the road from uh, Witz University and the park is being increasingly opened up to to the public and it features uh, a number of um, fine artworks but I'm focusing on my favorite here which is a spectacular very very detailed floor mosaic packed with amazing detail as you can see it's a celebration of nature and you've got um, you know plant life um, insects um, all kinds of uh, wonders of nature and it's really celebrating the fact that even in the even in the city in the urban environment uh, we need to connect with nature there are many opportunities for that it's good for our wellness um, and in fact uh, the one name for this artwork is the wellness wheel it's called the Spaza wellness wheel it was created by uh, the, the Spaza gallery group um, and it was designed in the first place by their, their founder their leader uh, Andrew Lindsay uh, he designed uh, this piece but then passed away very tragically in 2021 uh, Drew Lindsay the legendary artist died uh, and the work hadn't even started on the mosaic itself so it was taken over by members of his team and uh, they developed it I think beyond even his dreams and wishes um, so it becomes uh, in part a tribute a homage to Drew Lindsay 
it's about uh, you know nature bursting with life it's also about Drew's death you know because it was it became a kind of um, memorial to him so it has that depth of meaning it's about life and death um, it's also been called the mosaic compass so if you look around the edge of the circle uh, it points out many many uh, attractions in the area uh, you've got the the Mandela Bridge you've got the Newtown Cultural Precinct uh, Joburg Theatre Constitution Hill uh, and so on so it's also a guide and an orientation uh, to take you to uh, neighboring attractions. Right, so we are on Bertha Street in Bramfontein, um, outside Wits University. And uh, over here is the Holy Trinity Catholic Church. And here at the entrance we've got an, an artwork called the Homeless Jesus. Uh, so you've got a sleeping figure on the bench like many other homeless uh, but if you look closely at the feet you see that they are pierced and that is your clue to the fact that this represents in fact Jesus uh, but it's also talking about the importance of humanity uh, Christ's social message and it's something that is practiced at the church uh, they have um, they have over here you know a soup kitchen and services to support the needy and the homeless uh, so they're practicing what they preach and the artwork by an international artist Timothy Schmaltz uh, is one of many that he's created you know at churches in different parts of the world uh, carrying the same universal message of love and caring okay so um, we're looking across at uh, the giant Elant sculpture which is uh, a pretty huge concrete sculpture created by artist Clive Vandenberg around 2007 so this is already an iconic artwork it's at the gateway of Bramfontein uh, leading down what we call the cultural arc so we've seen there are many cultural attractions around here they're growing as well with the Indue Park just nearby you've got um, the Witz Art Gallery down there and leading towards the Newtown Cultural Precinct so the, the Ilant is making a statement about the area as it was before all modern development here the Ilant was one of those majestic creatures that inhabited the landscape here yeah, going back hundreds and hundreds of years and that's really what the artist wants to convey um, in a way it's uh, maybe related to the Nzunza portrait down the road because it's also talking about uh, pre-colonial pre-colonial histories and this one of course also relating to the to the natural world so, uh, we're here on the edge of Newtown. Uh, this is the, um, the Metro Mall taxi rank on what people still call Bree Street. Uh, and to welcome us here, we've got the mother and child uh, sculpture, which was uh, sort of made in a style of scrap metal, just to celebrate a loving relationship between the mother, or it could be a grandmother, <coughs> some people say it's a gogo. -go. Uh, she's uh, got an, in you know, an inquisitive child, and she's being very protective. Um, the artists who created the work are named on the base, <coughs> and um, the artwork has been here for more than ten years, but it looks in wonderful condition. Uh, it was, in fact. Um, you know repaired and refurbished just touched up recently um, so there was some graffiti tagging and so on but all of that has been made good and I think it's never looked better 
Okay, so we are now in the Newtown Cultural Precinct, which is the biggest cultural precinct in the country. And it's absolutely packed with uh, lots of public art. We're starting here with a statue of uh, musician Kipi Moketsi, who was a saxophone player, one of the all-time greats, played with Huma Sakela and Abdullah Ibrahim. And uh, Abdullah Ibrahim is somebody who held him in the highest regard. And it was thanks to him that this venue behind here was named Kippies. Okay, it was a thriving jazz club um, from about 1987 through the 90s and, and big names of jazz played here. The, um, the statue itself is telling uh, more of a sad story. So Kippy didn't get all the recognition and the success that some of his fellow musicians enjoyed overseas. Uh, he struggled with alcoholism and loneliness towards the end of his life. And uh, so it's called the Sad Man of Jazz. Uh, the sculptors were Egon Talia and Guy Dutoy. And they've made it uh, interactive to, you know, invite, um, invite some sort of participation. So one can sit here, as I'm doing, and keep company with Kippy and uh, maybe meditate on the sad life of many, many creative people who've given so much to the world. So as one travels over the Queen Elizabeth Bridge, you catch sight of the giant Firewalker, which is a steel sculpture uh, created by the famous artist uh, William Kentridge. Uh, together with Gerard Marx and it's it's referencing uh, the street life the trade that goes on uh, around the taxi ranks um, and and busy places in the in the inner city um, where the artists observed you know women in particular uh, who would be brying things like millies um, and and uh, what we call smileys uh, which are, you know, uh, sheep's heads. Uh, they would uh, cook these items on uh, braziers, okay, fiery braziers, or mbawula they call them, right? Um, <clears throat> and they would be seen carrying these burning braziers on their, on their heads, you know? Uh, an amazing balancing act which looks kind of uh, potentially dangerous and they would move to wherever the trade, you know, was. I think they were more of a feature in time gone by, uh, but captured by these artists. So, uh, that artwork is kind of dynamic. It's made of these metal plates, black and white uh, steel plates. And when you reach a certain vantage point, they merge together to create the silhouette of this woman. Uh, and as you move past again, the pieces break up and fragment. So it's, it's all about the moment and getting her, you know, in, into uh, that sweet spot where uh, you see her in her perfect form. Okay, so here we have another favorite artwork, one of the most loved in the city. Uh, it's the Brenda Farsi statue standing outside uh, the market theater. Uh, it was created by the sculptor Angus Taylor who did a very fine rendering. Now if you look at this, it's super realistic. I mean all the detail here, very very lifelike. And uh, if you look closely you will even find some lettering, um, you know, on the bronze. Uh, some of those are statements made by letter herself about the media. She had a love-hate relationship with the media. She reveled in the attention, uh, but of course um, there was also some something of the rebel in her uh, and, and, and uh, at times she would, she would be uh, also aggravated um, by the media. <coughs> um, 
Again, like the Kippi statue, it's an interactive artwork. It invites the person to sit down at the empty stool there and many a time you will see people clustered around here posing for selfies and just uh, you know embracing the moment that they share with uh, with Brenda Farsi. Um, the statue was uh, developed here in 2006 uh, by the Sunday Times uh, newspaper company. It was part of a big project to celebrate their centenary as a newspaper. They created artworks um, for the occasion here in Joburg, in Cape Town and other places around the country. And in Johannesburg, this was the signature piece, the poster girl, um, who really, you know, made, made the collection uh, in our city. We're just uh, walking through Newtown. We've come across the, the Mary Fitzgerald Square. And this whole walkway is lined with heads, uh, which uh, create a sea of African faces. So these are the, uh, the Newtown heads. They're actually made from railway sleepers. So it's incredibly tough wood. Um, they've been around for years and years, since uh, about 2003. And there are hundreds of heads uh, that were created. Uh, originally about 560 heads spread around different parts of Newtown. Uh, they were created by a group of Mozambican woodcutters uh, who used to be based in Newtown, not far from where we are. Um, and uh, they were led, they were led by America Guambe and America came back here a few years ago and he helped us to restore and refurbish uh, many of the heads. So the heads uh, represent different people and different cultures from the African continent. So it's celebrating uh, the diversity, the richness of culture, and each one has a whole lot of detail with the hairstyles, the headdress, the facial features. Um, yeah, so really um, bringing home the fact that, uh, you know, Africa is full, full of beautiful people, beautiful faces, different cultures, uh, so much to appreciate and explore. Okay, so, yeah, we're standing at the uh, Workers' Museum in Newtown, which is a site of high heritage significance. So this was a municipal workers' compound, which housed migrant laborers through a long period of the 20th century, starting here in 1913, and this place closed in 1982. And it still bears witness to the terrible conditions uh, in which people were held, you know. The living conditions are shown in the dormitories, which are still intact with very crude bunks that people uh, slept on. Uh, there's a punishment room. There are the uh, showers and the toilets, uh, which are very, very harsh and speak to the uh, the kind of uh, inhuman conditions uh, that, that were part and parcel of the migrant labor system. So the artwork here is called uh, the Statue of a Municipal Worker. And it was commissioned by the Municipal Workers Union, SAMU, to talk about the, um, Actually, this is the, you know, the contribution of, of municipal workers uh, who were actually housed here. In the early days, you had what they called the sanitation workers, people who picked up the night soil. You know, in early Joburg, even in the fancy areas, they didn't have waterborne sewerage. They had the bucket system. And these men would go and collect uh, the waste, um, you know, and, and, and bring it back on horse-drawn carts. That was the work. Uh, later on, you also had the power station workers 
living here. So the artwork is showing um, a worker dressed in orange uh, overalls and uh, he is tossing away his spade. Uh, maybe it's an act of defiance or maybe he is kind of uh, feeling some celebration and relief because it's now time to knock off and uh, well if he could return to his family uh, maybe but um, yeah that makes me think actually a lot of the people here were separated from their families they were deprived of all the normal comforts of home you know living here uh, like single men under very uh, very brutal conditions so it's uh, it's a very powerful uh, artwork in a very very stirring meaningful kind of setting okay. we're in the new town park and behind me is a giant steel sculpture which is called the banner of hope and what it is is a kind of artistic rendering of the south african flag so you've got the colors of the flag twisted and fragmented into some kind of new creative forms um, and it was a gift uh, a gift from the netherlands created by an artist called truce manga uh, in 1995 so it's really meant as a celebration of south africa's new democracy and i think it harks back to the role of the dutch anti-apartheid movement okay so we are outside chancellor house in ferreras town and this historic building housed the offices of mandela and tambo attorneys in the 1950s so that was a time when this was actually the only firm of uh, black owned attorneys and apartheid was on the rise there were many many harsh discriminatory laws that were you know um, bombarding african people and causing a lot of grief and a whole number of those people came here for legal representation and some kind of support and defense so these these officers were inundated with desperate people you know needing uh, needing legal uh, assistance um, and you had uh, Mandela and Tambo practicing law from here representing people in the law courts and just over on this side you have the magistrates courts where they appeared and across town in Pritchard Street you know there was the the high court where again they, they appeared um, in the uh, in the in the law courts uh, and of course with Mandela he appeared on both sides of the both sides of the dock you know uh, first he was um, defending others and then eventually he was um, you know he was being tried so the artwork uh, over here which is a giant steel representation of a boxer it's by uh, the artist Marco Cianfanelli and uh, it's quite profound you know it talks on the one hand about Mandela's personal interest in boxing so he was an amateur boxer he spent many nights sparring um, and it's something that he enjoyed he said not for the blood sport what attracted him was the strategy of being in the ring you know uh, facing an opponent not only with brute force but also trying to um, use strategy to overcome an opponent and uh, this what the artist is actually saying is that that is in some ways uh, like the other combats that Mandela was engaged in he was fighting the system you know in the, in the law courts he was trying to defend people um, and use the rules whatever rules there are like the rules of boxing um, to serve his own purpose so the artwork is called the shadow boxer it re references a an iconic uh, photograph 
uh, which you have over here on the signboard. Uh, this is a picture by um, Bob Gossani, who was a photojournalist with uh, Drum Magazine. And it shows Nelson Mandela sparring against uh, one of the real champions of the time, a boxer called Jerry Malloy. So this was on the rooftop of a newspaper building. It, it was, uh, you know, not far from here. In the, in the city center. Um, so, uh, there you have, it, it ties everything together. Chancellor House, which was their base, uh, the law courts over here, the wider struggle against apartheid. Um, and yeah, it's just so fitting. So, we are on Main Street. Uh, we're in the Anglo-American precinct, although Anglo has gone to Rosebank, they've left some magnificent buildings uh, and a wonderful environment and it's crowned by great public art and this this is an absolutely iconic Joburg artwork much loved one one of the all-time favorites uh, it's called the the Leaping Impala it's also been called Impala Stampede and it was created um, by Hermann Walt. Uh, it used to sit uh, down the road uh, in what was uh, the Ernest Oppenheimer Park. Well the park still exists uh, but the buck were moved here after having been horribly vandalized and it's worth having a closer look to uh, get an idea of what happened. So, if you look very closely at the necks, some of those necks have been joined and repaired. It's, it's a very good job, but you can make out the repair marks and even the hooves. So, the, the, the buck were um, de decapitated and de-hooved. And of course, there was terrible shock and what most people, many people, still don't know yet is that the artwork was saved. Those, um, uh, those heads and hooves were very carefully joined. It was done by the, um, uh, by the son of the artist, uh, Mark Walt, who had the original drawings. And the whole artwork was wonderfully recreated and brought here to a very beautiful and tranquil setting so that we can still um, appreciate it in all its glory. So the, the original artwork was uh, create, created for the Oppenheimer family. It was in honor of Ernest Oppenheimer who created the mining empire of the Oppenheimers and Anglo-American and it was a gift to the city of Joburg and it's still very much part of the inner city um, I was reading also uh, just this morning about the influences on the artist and it's quite fascinating that he was influenced by early animated films particularly the Walt Disney movie of Bambi from 1944 you can imagine the the pictures of the you know of the buck leaping and so on and that's uh, yeah I think uh, very much part of this all the all the movement and the life so that's your leaping impala so we are on Main Street it's called uh, the Main Street mining mall and this is a strip uh, that was occupied by the big mining houses, the giants of the industry, like Anglo-American, and over here was the Chamber of Mines, uh, the Stock Exchange was just nearby. So um, this was a powerhouse of mining and also the big financial houses. And today you've got uh, artworks and exhibitions, uh, storyboards running down the street. Uh, talking about the history of, uh, of mining in this country. Uh, and this monument is part of that story 
but it's part that wasn't told until quite recently. So a lot of the a lot of the history and the narratives that you get along here uh, are singing the praises really of the um, the landlords, the big mining magnates, and how they built uh, the economy. But behind that, you had the workers who toiled and suffered underground in terrible conditions. Uh, you know often at, uh, at, at risk to themselves and earning low wages. And this particular monument speaks to that. Uh, it's an outcome. It came out of the, um, some negotiations uh, between the mining unions uh, and, and the Chamber of Mines. It's now called the Minerals, the Minerals Council. Uh, the unions insisted on um, having a monument that spoke to the contribution of black mine workers and this was the outcome so it shows uh, a mine worker toiling with his drill uh, at the rock face and the artwork was created by a self-taught artist from the Eastern Cape uh, called Andile Maswangelwa. Okay, and you can see it's right on this busy street with taxis and cars hurtling past. It used to be called Sawa, it's now Pixley Seme. So it's highly visible right at the center of the mining district. Okay, so still on Main Street, up there you have a fiber class replica of the famous Mapungubwe Rhino and it's there to talk to the fact that uh, mining didn't just start even gold mining did not start uh, with the um, colonial period it dates back uh, much further and um, we think here particularly of the first African kingdom which was in Mapungubwe on a hill uh, you had the first African kings in southern Africa many hundreds of years ago and uh, one of the famous relics from that is this, this Map the Mapungubwe rhino which is also pictured here so the original was pretty tiny uh, I think about 12 centimeters uh, with a wooden core and then a real gold foil around it very beautifully tooled if you look at those tiny nails and so on um, and uh, the original was found in 1934 and kept at uh, Pretoria University uh, but here we have a memory of it so we're inside the JCI building still on Main Street um, and this is a site many people would find uh, a pleasant surprise it's a giant artwork it's called Rock Face um, created by the artist Mickey Kozenik and normally it's got a, a water feature that that works um, and it's talking to the fact of the, you know, the mining industry, uh, the importance of water, um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's colossal in this beautiful kind of cathedral space with a the, with the vaulted ceiling. Um, and it's just on a massive scale. This is 25 tons of steel. Um, and uh, a, a beautiful construction and pretty much open to people whoever wants to walk through right so uh, we we are now at the national union of mine workers num the head office which is uh, on risk street over there uh, we're in the courtyard where they have a wonderful collection of worker artworks okay so behind me of fabulous mosaics um, beautiful beautiful colors um, created with mine workers themselves 
So the, um, the work was coordinated by Drew Lindsay, who I mentioned before, uh, the great mosaic artist, together with Lindsay Kendall, and they trained and guided uh, artists from the mines in Clarksdorp. And this is, uh, this is the outcome. Oh, yeah. So beautifully kept and uh, I mean, look, look at that. If you just look at, uh, that's not just a, you know, an emblem. Um, the, the, the colors and the, the whole effect is just, uh, I think it's eye popping. Yeah. And you know what's special about this? It doesn't feel like a propaganda art, you know? It feels like a, a human depiction of, uh, you know, people's working lives. Yeah. Even the, the metal work uh, is very special. And also well preserved. So, I think that's it. So, it is worth the trouble, David. Okay, so we are on Gandhi Square. Today this is a bustling transport hub with buses going to and fro to all parts of the city. But if we go back uh, more than a hundred years, this area was the original legal precinct of the city. So you had the law courts actually in the middle of the square. This place was called Government Square in that, day, in, in that time. And you had uh, lawyers' offices clustered all around. And in 1904, after the Anglo-Boer War, M.K. Gandhi, the famous Indian leader, came and settled here. And he practiced as a lawyer appearing in those law courts and very interestingly he appeared like like Mandela and others he appeared on both sides of the dock both as a as a defender uh, for his own people uh, but also as an accused and at one stage in 1908 Gandhi was uh, was tried and sentenced here and then sent and 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 um, you know sent for his first term of imprisonment, which was at the fort, now Constitution Hill. So that's the background. And now the artwork. This is a, an artwork uh, depicting the younger Gandhi. We often um, we often see G Gandhi as the elder man, wearing the minimalist clothing. It's it's called a dhoti, like a loincloth and not much else, sandals and the dhoti. But this is depicting Gandhi as the legal man, as he was practicing in Johannesburg. So he's shown in his legal gown, aged about 32. Um, the artwork is, uh, is by Tinker Christopher, and it was unveiled here in 2003. Um, we are on Fox Street. Uh, that's the Carlton Center just behind us and we're looking at an artwork called the newspaper vendor so it's it's kind of life life scale life size and and realistic uh, showing an ordinary youngster selling newspapers on a street corner and I think at the time that this went up in 2006 that was quite a common sight but today, well, we hardly see actual newspapers and even less newspaper sellers because, of course, the, all of this has been overtaken by the digital revolution, which is represented right here by uh, the cell phone shop, which I won't name. Okay, so um, when, the, when the artwork uh, happened, it was just to depict something which uh, was so common uh, that people might almost overlook it, you know? 
at every intersection you had um, one or more people actually selling newspapers um, the artwork was uh, uh, was was commissioned by the big paper company Sapi and it was dedicated by them to the newspaper industry which was one of their big customers uh, the work was created by an artist called Russell Scott and then donated to the city and uh, we placed it here on, on a busy corner so there you go Okay, so um, this brings us to uh, we're just outside the old uh, Alhambra Theatre and lining the road here on Bait Street you have a row of angels standing on high pedestals so there are four four angels um, which were brought here in 2009 um, the artist was uh, Zamo Gumede and um, they still um, mark the site of the Alhambra Theatre so the Alhambra closed its doors many years ago already as a theatre now it serves as a funeral parlour and I suppose the angels are here to carry carry the departed off to their final resting places. So we're here under the, under the Joslova Bridge. Um, we've got these giant pillars which are covered in mosaic. So these are the mosaic pillars that were done first of all before the 2010 uh, soccer World Cup and they just help to brighten what could be quite a, a dark and unfriendly space so you'll see it's mostly white uh, but little spots of color and they've got these um, uh, the mirrors that give off little flashes of light so it all helps to give you know some kind of um, some kind of uplift, some kind of um, more welcoming feel to the whole place. And these have just been recently cleaned, like um, very painstakingly cleaned by some of the original artists. It was done by the um, Espaza Arts Collective, which is based not far from here in Troibel. And uh, they're, they're really an act of love, and, and the people came back here. Just, just to clean because it means a lot. Right, so we're in New Duenfantin at a taxi rank called Place of the Cows. And uh, you've got cows here created in 2010 by a group of artists led by Andile Maswangawa. Uh, he made them out of frames with chicken wire and some of them are covered in mosaic. And they talk about, you know, uh, the rural heartland so this is a long distance taxi rank people are coming and going from they're going to uh, you know distant rural homes and um, the cows talk about the longing for home uh, the relationship between the urban area and um, the rural the rural places that people go back to and where they might retire and of course cows are central to people's ideas of wealth and where they come from. Okay guys, that, that hit was how many monuments we did guys? Uh, I think Eric will know. Uh, we did so many. How many Eric? It was maybe 26. 26, yeah? that's, crazy. that's crazy. Okay guys, I hope you guys enjoy uh, this amazing tour we did around the monuments, around Johannesburg guys. Make sure to subscribe, you share and destroy that like button. And we will see you in the next Living Estate V video.